first, uh, thanks for inviting me to give this presentation. Um, in this talk, I'm going to cover some of the recent advances in surface wave tomography and seismic interferometry, also called uh, ambient noise cross correction technique uh, to image Earth from shallow to deep. And before I start, I just want to thank um, all the people that make the Earth scope happen, which is just a wonderful. And in fact, I decided to jump ship from physics to geophysics um, in 2006, just because I realized I really cannot collect data myself in a physics lab and realize there's a, this wonderful geophysics community willing to give out the data for free. So <laughs> it, it's, it's great. Um, so Western US is uh, obviously a very interesting place to look for, um, understand the lithosphere structure. And in particular, we have a lot of um, topography variation over the US. So in, in overall, we have this rougher surface near the western US compared to the eastern US. And we also, in general, the topography is high. We also have a lot of uh, volcanism, including the uh, St. Helen in Washington, as well as Yellowstone in Wyoming. And when we go across the front range to the eastern side, then suddenly we are in uh, this uh, much flatter regime. So it, it's nice to be able to understand what's going on in the lithosphere structure, kind of how they relate to these kind of geologic features. And surface wave it provided a very direct uh, tool to measure this type of lithosphere structure because surface wave in general propagate near the surface. And um, as mentioned by uh, Charles Linston yesterday, um, with the US ray right now, we can actually track the wave field across uh, this array uh, nicely. And this is probably the first time we can track the surface wave coherently across this uh, l large area. So it naturally promotes some new development in terms of uh, tomography technique. So here shows an example of the earthquake waveform measured from a uh, Curia Island event. And after we bend past the signal to 60 second Rayleigh wave, then we can actually measure the travel time at each station, which is shown on the um, lower left. And um, because we have this dense coverage, then we can actually map out the travel time and determine the travel time map. At the same time, we can also measure the amplitude across all the stations and determine this amplitude map. And a direct consequence of being to produce this type of travel, map, travel time map and amplitude map is that we can uh, directly determine uh, the phase velocity of surface ray even without a formal inversion. So the way you can do it is that um, similar to the uh, gradiometry technique proposed yesterday, you can just simply take the gradient of the travel time map. The travel time map shown here for that single earthquake. If you take the gradient of that travel time, that will directly give you the apparent uh, phase speed uh, for that particular earthquake. But this is only accurate to a certain degree. And if we really want to consider finite frequency effects such as Wave, uh, wave, wave interfer uh, interference or wave from healing, we really need to consider a correction term, which is um, the Laplacian of amplitude term here. And if you calculate that, and you can c use that to correct the first term, and then if you put them together, you got a better picture of um, what the velocity structure looks like in the mantle. And here shows the velocity for that particular earthquake. So note that this is single earthquake and you already can see some of the very dominant features such as the slow anomaly near the Snake River Pen and Yellowstone Hotspot track as well as the Southern Rocky. So of course we can apply this type of technique to all different earthquakes and um, average all the um, phase velocity measurement up. But moreover, one another important advantage of having US array is that in fact right now with the ambient noise cross creation technique each of the station now can be considered as a virtual source. So here shows an example if you do cross correction between one of the US array station, 06C, and do cross correction between this station to all other stations. And if you plot the cross correction function and sort it based on distance, you can see the move out of really way very nicely. So the fact is that right now, um, using this ambient noise technique, all the stations become not just a receiver, but also become a virtual source. And because US Array provides a very wide range of uh, station location, which allows us to have a very nice station receiver coverage. 
And just to show that um, how this ambient noise actually can give us the virtual source um, in, a, in a kind of animation way, here I'm going to uh, show how the energy move out for a virtual source located in one of the US array shown here as a star. So in, in this movie, I basically do cross question between this uh, star station to all other stations. And then to uh, basically mimic what will happen if we put a virtual source here. So on the left hand side, we are uh, showing the Rayleigh wave emitted by basically vertical, vertical cross creation. On the right hand side, I'm going to show the love wave emitted by um, this virtual source, but based on the transverse, transverse cross creations. So you can see that right now after I play the movie, the uh, wave radiates out in almost all direction. And if I stop here, you can realize that um, the circle on the right is a little bit larger compared to the left because uh, love wave usually propagates slightly faster than ready wave. Um, and it's mostly going in all directions. That suggests we can use this to um, image this structure very nicely. And the fact is, uh, all the, we can measure, now measure the, um, the propagation of surface wave coming from all different directions. So we can now determine for each location, for each period, and for each direction, we can make, um, make a phase velocity measurement. And you can see that for different azimuths, for this particular location, for different period, they all show some sort of variation depending on the azimuthal uh, of the wave coming from. And this allows us not only to be able to measure isotropic structure, but also an isotropy structure. And basically, isotropic structure is the mean of this sine function, and an isotropy um, can be derived from the variation of this sine function. So if we summarize what it looks like so far with the US array isotropic structure in the US, you can start to see a lot of features that can be compared with surface, wave, uh, surface geologic feature. So here I show the uh, radio wave phase for us the speed map from 10, 30 to 80 seconds. So they are sensitive to structure at um, upper cross, middle cross range, lower cross, upper most mental range, and upper mental. And in the 10 second, you can see some of the uh, very shallow features, such as Central Valley show up as very nicely as slow anomaly. Uh, uh, this is the Green River Basin. Basically, mo most major sedimentary basins show up as slow anomaly. On the other hand, the fast anomaly usually are related to uh, high, high topography, such as Sierra Nevada, um, Cascadia Range, and Colorado Plateau shown here. And when we go to 30 seconds, we start to see some deeper features, such as the Snake River Plain, Yellowstone, hot spot track. And the edge of the Colorado show up very nicely with slow anomalies. And overall, we see this um, difference between West and U.S. show up as, uh, as more slow anomaly compared to the eastern side, which suggests um, this is probably the reason we have more volcanism and higher topography on the western side. And when we go to 80 seconds, now we start to see some of the mental features, including the subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate, as well as the uh, Snake River plain. And overall, east-west, again, we see these very different velocity structures. So another advantage of US array right now is that um, we can actually use some of the receiver terms that traditionally we does not use in our tomography method. One of the receiver term, of course, is the receiver function, which is widely used to study discontinuity in the cross and mental. Um, but here I'm going to show another uh, receiver term called radio wave ellipticity. So for earthquake, again, using the Curie Island earthquake as an example, it coming from this direction. And if you take two stations out of um, the US array, and you bend perhaps the signal to 60 second radio wave, and plot the particle motion in radio and vertical direction, you can see this kind of lip, lip particle motion. And for different stations, actually, they have different character of the, the particle motion. For example, on the, uh, the top one, which is actually located in the Green River Basin, the, uh, it's more like circular pattern. But if you go to a station in the south on top of Southern Rocky, the particle motion is more elongated in the further direction. So uh, we, we can actually characterize this kind of ellipticity by taking the ratio between horizontal and vertical amplitude. And you, uh, you can see this uh, one basically have uh, a little bit higher 
uh, horizontal component, and that's why we say it's high HV ratio. And for this one, it's low HV ratio. And we can do this for all different stations and for, for all different earthquakes. And here shows the result for 30 second uh, electricity or HV ratio map compared with the 30 second phase velocity map. And also the sensitivity kernel is also shown um, for the HV ratio measurement and phase velocity measurement. You can see that HV ratio map, HV, H over V ratio map, particular sensitive to shallow structures. And here, there's three type of um, sensitivity. One is for VS, the red is for VS, the green is for VP, and the blue is for um, density. So not only the phase for RC and HV ratio have different depth sensitivity, they overall have very dis different sensitivity to different three parameters. So in principle, by including both measurements, it will uh, potentially allow us to resolve density structures. And here in the HV ratio map, HV ratio map over um, at 30 seconds, you can actually see that some of the high HV ratio uh, region can be related to major sedimentary basins, such as Wallerstein Basin over here, and Powell River Basin over here, Denver Basin, Green River Basin. They all show up very nicely. And we can actually measure the same type of uh, measurement using um, ambient noise. So here shows an example if you do cross correction between two US array station. And now you can um, not only use vertical, vertical, but also include the radio component. So you have radio, radio, cross correction, radio, vertical, vertical, radio, vertical, vertical. And by using a different combination of this cross correction, you can now measure the elasticity to a much higher frequency. So here's just the example at eight second. So the, f the station um, on the top you can actually see that um, it's elongated again in the vertical direction. The one in the south, on the other hand, have a larger component in horizontal, and that's why we say it's have high HV ratio. So we can do this again from different uh, sources. Diff basically, each station can be considered as sources now, and we can also do that for um, different location. And we can map out the um, HV ratio map at a second shown here. So here shows the result at a second, which is constrained based on ambient noise. We have 30 seconds and 60 seconds based on earthquakes. And you can see that there's a lot of uh, feature that um, we already know that relate to the cluster features. In particular, I want to point out a region near the Columbia River Basin here. Now at a second, we actually see a very small HV ratio, such as there's high velocity near the top, top one kilometer, in fact. And if we go to 30 seconds, on the other hand, we right now see high HV ratio, such as that right beneath that high velocity, we actually have low velocity. So this actually is um, clear related to what we already know in this area, that uh, 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 Columbia River Basso is sitting on top of the Columbia River Basin sediment. So this shows how we can actually now resolve structure at the very, very uh, shallow part of the Earth using this technique. And here I'm just going to show one example um, using a, a location at, in Western Basin here. And if we take out the phase velocity map and choose that location and determine the phase velocity at that point for different period, so from a second all the way to 100 seconds, and we can also do the same for HV ratio from 24 seconds to 100 seconds at this point. Um, so you can see the, uh, the measurement over here. So the idea is we try to find a 1D structure beneath that location such that we can expand both measurements. So here I'm showing uh, three uh, models. So the best model fitting the observation is this model three, um, which first different from uh, the the first two models is that it not only requires uh, the, the model to have a very shallow slow anomaly in the top three kilometer, but it also requires to have a, a lighter material as well as high VPVS ratio at the very shallow part so that we can explain the data. And actually, we know the structure here pretty well because there's um, oil, and oil and gas exploration here we know that there's approximately three kilometer sediments over uh, in this region. So this is exactly what we observe using this technique. And also because the thick sediment here, uh, we know that it, it contains lighter material 
as well as high VPVS ratio, both are a character of the um, sedimentary basin. So we apply that kind of inversion to everywhere um, in the U Western US. And you can see now the top three kilometer structure. So shear velocity, mostly slower velocity can be observed in almost all the sedimentary basin. And probably more interesting is that wherever we see this low velocity, we also see major uh, light material, light small density, as well as high VPVS ratio. So just now we can not only constrain shear velocity, but also constrain uh, density and VPVS ratio at the very shallow part of the Earth. And if we look deeper, we can see some of the other feature. So for example, here shows the uh, 15 kilometer depth slice. Um, the isotropic structure is mapping in the background, and uh, an isotropy is showing in the, uh, in, as a yellow bar. So basically, each yellow bar represents the direction of the anisotropy, where the length of the yellow bar represents the strength of an isotropy. Here shows the result at 50 second depth. And we can see that the crust and mantle feature actually looks very different. In the crust, um, at 15 kilometer depth, the isotropic structure mostly shows off some several uh, dominant batteries, such as the one beneath uh, Snake River Plain and Yellowstone Haspa track. And here's the Columbia River, uh, no, the Colorado Plateau. And this is the batteries of Sierra Nevada. And on the other hand, um, in the uppermost mantle, the slow anomaly is constrained to areas such as like Snake River Plain and also just right beneath the um, high level plain. So, as an isotropy also shows a very interesting pattern. In general, the anisotropy we observe in the cross and upper mantle are very different. For example, within the basin range, you can see that the anisotropy pattern looks pretty coherent, mostly north south oriented. But in the basin range province within the uppermost mantle, we can actually see this turn that um, a lot of SKS splitting results already see. And um, also, this turning of the S, uh, uh, fast direction actually is coincide with the change of uh, the velocity structure from slow to fast to slow. So it suggests there might be some um, more complicated deformation process going on over here. And um, there's one suggestion told to me yesterday that maybe this is related to the opening of the Baja California. But of course, more study will be needed. And if we look at the um, fast anomaly near the San Andreas Fault, we can actually see that it's mostly fault parallel. When we go over to the north, go through the triple junction, it changes rapidly toward the direction of the subduction of the Juan de Fuca plate. So one, one more interesting thing recently we got um, is that we now realize that just because extra surface wave out of ambient noise coruscation, you can actually observe body wave as well. So you can do this by using all the um, virtual source in, across US array. So basically in this uh, study, we stack all the um, virtual source using all the US array and sort all the cross creation based on different distant being. And this is what you can observe in that kind of study. So beside the surface wave that dominate the signal, right now you can actually start to see some of the dominant core phases that can be observed. Um, here is SCS, which is the S wave reflect out of the core mental boundary, as well as PKIKP2, which is the P wave reflect out of the other side of the Earth. So go through outer core and inner core. So um, based on these two phases, then now we potentially have a new tool to study deeper Earth structure. And just show you that we don't really need the whole US array. If you just use a sub-array, say, within this circle, and do the cross creation and stack them, you can still see these two phases. And in fact, you can map out the uh, travel time variation for these two phases uh, for different sub-array. And this is what we, it looks like. So this is the travel time variation for SCS phase and for the PKIKP phase. And you can see that um, because this goes through the upper mental structure, so potentially it why it takes longer to travel in the Western US is particularly due to the uh, upper mental structure or slow anomaly in the upper mantle. And um, well, I'm, I'm not going to show more uh, too much. This is pretty preliminary, but this indicates that potentially we can use this new tool to study deeper Earth. So here I'm just going to show a final take of what my thought about can be the next 
you know, small slash big things. So here we have a, an array in the uh, Southern California in Long Beach. So this is small in a way. It's seven cross uh, uh, north south and five kilometer east west. But we do have five thousand stations here. This is um, kind of courtesy to the oil company doing some sort of exploration seismology here. But they do all, um, record all the ambient noise. And if you do uh, ambient noise cross creation. And you can again use each of the stations to create this virtual source and observe the surface ray propagating with this tiny area. Of course, it's a higher frequency signal. But with that, we can now infer for structure in the top one kilometer using this technique with unprecedented high resolution. And the fact is that there's actually active um, new point for running across this array. And now we can start to see some of the um, shallow cross structure that associates this full system, which I think is quite amazing and potentially have a lot of implication to a more broad geologic society. So thanks. <laughs>